Hello there, and welcome to the latest update of our Global Outlook here at the Economist Intelligence Unit. My name is John Ferguson, Country Analysis Director, and today I'm joined by Agat Demare, Global Forecasting Director, and Kaylin Birch, our Global Economist. We have a great video for you today. We're going to have two really, really important areas and two really significant forecasts. One relates to uh, US foreign policy in the Middle East, in, in this case Syria, and the other is the potential impeachment of the US President. Caitlin, okay, before, we, before we get to Trump's domestic troubles, mm. let's focus on Trump's foreign policy with a GATT. Just to provide some context here, we started to warn our clients and, and tell our clients back in January of the coming volatility in sort of US foreign policy. And we actually wrote after the resignation of, of, of James Mattis, then uh, Defence Secretary, that the departure of Mr Mattis from the administration removes a major constraint on Mr. Trump's ability to put his personal stamp on US foreign policy. Nine, ten months later, here we are, and in terms of Syria, Mr. Trump has definitely put his own stamp on this foreign policy area. So again, for those not following the events day to day, uh, like, like we do here at the EIU, can you just give us a bit of a recap on, on what's, what's happened here, recent events in terms of Turkey, Trump and Syria? Sure, thanks very much, John. So I think the first thing that we need to say is the situation is extremely volatile. Fast moving. Um, so as, as we speak today, here's what happened. Last week on Wednesday, Donald Trump announced that he would redeploy 100 US troops that were stationed at the border between Syria and Turkey further south. And this means that Turkey went ahead with a military offensive against Kurdish fighters, Kurdish fighters that were fighting against Islamic State, Daesh, in Syria. So this was a very complicated situation. Um, the US basically abandoned its former ally, the Kurdish, which led to an outcry internationally. A number of countries, uh, especially in the European Union, condemned um, the military offensive. There were discussions at the UN Security Council. Fast forward to yesterday, and I'm sure we're going to, to follow up on this, we had finally a ceasefire. Uh, what happened is that now we have an agreement between the US and Turkey to have a ceasefire, to let the Kurdish fighters escape or go somewhere else, but the situation is still extremely complicated. And Absolutely. what this means mm -hmm. is on the ground, looking at the Syria perspective now, the Kurdish have joined Bashar al-Assad, they've turned to the regime, the Syrian regime, which they is... formed a new alliance, you know, ha having mm -hmm. to, Absolutely. forced to almost form a new alliance. There. Absolutely, they've formed this new alliance with the Syrian regime, which is extremely significant. And all in all, if we take a look at the global perspective, I would say there's only one winner here, and it's Russia. Because Russia hasn't, hasn't done anything, and it sees the US withdrawing. Russia hasn't antagonized Turkey. Russia is still speaking with everyone in the region, Turkey, Syria, So this Israel, just amplifies Iran. Russia's role in the Middle East in Syria. Absolutely. So this just amplifies Russia's role. And what we think is going to happen is that Russia is going to play a bigger and bigger role in Syria. And that point is exactly why I wanted to start with our sort of uh, the context from January. Um, ironically, James Mattis disagreed with Trump on mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. like Syrian policy, which led to his resignation. Because it's... The reason why I said it was sort of his personal touch is because it's hard to see many people in the US who would agree with what's happened here mm -hmm. and giving a country like Russia that sort of amplification and more significant role in, in Syria. Yes, absolutely. I think that in the big picture, and it's something that we discuss at length in our global outlook, I think in the big picture what we have now is that in a number of countries around the world, in a number of conflicts around the world, such as Syria, but also Ukraine, and also difficult places such as Iran or Venezuela, we have a number of proxy, I don't want to say conflicts always, but... Right. Yes, um, disagreements between the US and Russia, and these play out through conf these proxy places such as Syria. And now we have the US on the one hand, we have Russia on the other hand, and they fight for different stances there. Absolutely. So just coming back to the agreement, which mm -hmm. as we sit here was, uh, was, was yesterday, yes. but as you mentioned a few minutes ago, this is fast moving, and mm -hmm. this time next week we could be in a different situation altogether, so, but it was a five day, I mm -hmm. believe, 120 hour ceasefire. Yes. Fast moving very volatile situation, but how do we think that this is going to unfold? What are the things that we should be watching to help us understand how this may unfold? Sure, so there was a meeting yesterday between the US Vice President and the Turkish President in Ankara, and after four hours what they announced is a 120 hour ceasefire, that's five days ceasefire, and during this ceasefire Kurdish troops are going to be able to withdraw from the area. So this means basically that Turkey is not 
going to be able to fight against them during this period. So the US can go back and say, well, we saved our former allies, Kurdish troops are not going to be attacked by the Turkish military, they have ample time to withdraw, they have five days to withdraw. Right. And I'm sure that during these negotiations, the US told Turkey that it had ample ammunition to annoy Turkey if Turkey refused to make this bargain and to make compromises. We've seen a lot of moves with US sanctions recently against Turkey. So the US so far has only opposed symbolic sanctions against Turkey, against individuals or banks. We had movement on this regarding Halk Bank. It's a Turkish bank and that has had a number of issues with um, the US Department of Justice in recent months. But I'm sure that the US made it very clear to Turkey that it had leverage to actually make it very painful for Absolutely. a Turkish economy if Turkey So that's the risk, that's the risk to, the, to, to, to Turkey's economy and the business environment of, of more sanctions mm -hmm. you know, being imposed. And that could come from, what, Turkey not following the US's instructions or advice in terms of how this unfolds over the next couple of weeks? Yes, absolutely. Well, Turkey experienced a currency crisis last summer, August 2018, and that was very, very significant. And it's still in recovery mode. It's still yes. railing from this currency crisis. And what we had argued at the time at the Economist Intelligence Unit is that this currency crisis was mainly due to tensions in the US-Turkey relations. And if the US went ahead and imposed wide-ranging, stringent sections, that is to say, sectoral sanctions mm -hmm. against, for instance, the energy sector in Turkey, well, this would So rather would than just symbolic, these are sectoral sections, much bigger, much yeah. more impactful. Much bigger, much more impactful. And we have, we have to remember here that US sanctions are extraterritorial, so they apply to every company around the world if they use the US dollar, that is to say, pretty much every company around yeah. the world. And I'm sure that the US made it very clear that it did if Turkey didn't give in and didn't make any compromises, the US would impose sectoral, wide-ranging, stringent sanctions against Turkey and that this would have a very significant impact on Excellent. the Turkish lira and then on the economy. And that's the sort of cloud risk still hanging over the Turkish economy over the next few weeks as this unfolds? Yes, absolutely. Well, I think that so far what we've seen is um, some relief from investors. I think a lot of investors um, were worried about the US potentially imposing these sanctions against Turkey over the past few days. They were very relieved to see symbolic sanctions as we had forecast at the Economist Intelligence Unit, but investors are still very wary about the situation and if we saw the US go ahead with something really stringent, then the lira would probably crash. Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I mean, this is, again, fast moving. I'm sure we'll come back to it um, mm -hmm. yes. in, our, in our future videos. Mm -hmm. Kaylin, from sort of US foreign policy to US domestic mm -hmm. issues and domestic troubles for the president. Of which he has a fair number. They are mounting. Mm -hmm. So. We've been talking about, and people are being asking us about, possible impeachment of, of the US president, basically since he mm -hmm. came into office. What, what's, what's been the trigger? Why is it now front and centre in the news and front and centre in, in conversation, and particularly with the US Democrats? What was the trigger? I think, simply put, this is the first clear-cut case where there's been a clear allegation, a limited event that allows for kind of coalescing of minds and an easy kind of way of communicating the thing that is being alleged. Um, which we'll come to in just a moment. Um, but beyond the clarity of this particular case, um, it's the national security implications as well that, for me, raise a lot of questions. So a very quick sort of overview of where we stand now. The House uh, various committees launched a formal impeachment process. So this is still just on an inquiry phase. We're yet to get to a vote. Right. Um, we have six different House committees that are investigating various components of essentially what is... Uh, an allegation that Donald Trump used the power of his office and withheld taxpayer funds to a foreign ally uh, in order to coerce that ally to produce information on his own political rival. So for his own political benefit. In this case, U Ukraine. In this case, Ukraine, right. And involved his own personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York, um, in this, which adds yet another personal element where he's using the power of the office for personal gain, but also involving a foreign power, potentially in the integrity of a U.S. national right. election. So lots of alarm bells and That's focusing on, so it's become a lot more concrete, a lot more tangible. Right. Uh, it's a clear-cut case. The, the Mueller investigation that went on for more than two years and resulted in an extremely long report with various investigations that were spawned off of it. 
was a, a difficult thing to communicate, and, and the report itself highlighted instances where sometimes the president's behavior, again, relating to the 2016 election, um, could have been slightly suspect or could have been considered an obstruction of justice, but there was no clear charge. It became so kind of amorphous, this this confusing right. um, kind of a situation, that it was very difficult to turn that into an impeachment proceeding, uh, which really didn't have the solid ground that it needed. Because right. really, uh, and I, what I would say, the second kind of important point to take away from this is not just it's a clear-cut case and it has serious implications for national security, but also that the political calculus for Democrats has changed this time around. Um, the reason that we saw Nancy Pelosi, the uh, Democratic House Speaker, holding back on a, an impeachment investigation, although many members of her party, including many from the left-leaning, more progressive wing, um, and many candidates for the 2020 election have been pushing for it, she'd held back because there is potentially a domestic political backlash that will hurt Democrats who are defending seats in 2020 or hoping to turn a Republican to a Democratic seat in either the House or the Senate. Right. And so this, they kind of thought, unless there's a clear case, best to hold off on what's going to be a politically damaging process for both sides and, and try to give Democrats the best possible chance in 2020. But again, because we're seeing this sort of generating consensus around the seriousness of the case and the fact that it's clear cut, Pelosi decided time yeah. to pull off the band-aid. And, and we're seeing and some it. public support for this. Yes, we've and seen so public opinion polls. is going to play, play a pretty cons uh, important role right. in how this unfolds over coming So this months. is also a very fast-moving situation. Yeah. We're already seeing very quick progress on the investigation. In recent days, we've seen um, kind of the deposition or, or congressional testimony of serious, very high-level uh, members of the administration who were key advisors to Mr. Trump uh, in this kind of Ukraine um, crisis, the former ambassador to the EU, uh, former advisor on European affairs, Fiona Hill, all this adds to the evidence that, that this is going to be serious, this investigation, and that it's going to move very quickly. So I expect we'd see a vote before the end of the year. Um, however, to, to kind of lay out our core forecast, we now think it's likely, or that it will happen, that the House will vote to impeach right. President Trump. That's partially because public opinion is starting to move up. So we've seen national level polls that see somewhere over 50%, between 51 and 52. So like a very narrow margin of people do support impeachment. Right. Um, this, of course, is perfect. Polling is always fluid and it's, it, there's always kind of you know, a variety of answers you can get from any single polling um, base. But um, I think there, it's clear that there is kind of momentum growing for this. But I think the House still, again, we're talking about dem Democratic-led House of Representatives would probably vote to impeach him, given the seriousness of the evidence. And again, we have seen a lot of kind of elements coming out that would absolutely support an impeachment vote on purely objective grounds. Right. However, once that vote happens, then that verdict is turned over to the Senate. And only the Senate, which again is Republican controlled, is able to hold a trial, and they will either acquit or convict. Mr. Trump. If convicted, he would be removed from office. If acquitted, obviously, he'd remain. Um, at the moment, as political support for the president stands, we think he would be acquitted. Absolutely. And that will remain the case until public opinion form, so support for Mr. Trump, not just kind of a national level support for impeachment, but of his core base, that 40 to 44 percent of the population who respond regularly to surveys, that would have to start to erode to the level that Republicans would start to see Trump as a liability for their own re-election in 2020 rather than an yeah. asset. And, and at the moment, they don't That's see him yet. as a liability, but that would be the, the shift they would need to make, right. driven by public support. For impeachment. And interestingly, the Syria debacle has been one thing that's driven a very stark, very public divide between Trump and congressional Republicans, who, you know, historically speaking, are much more a party of maintaining Absolutely. solid alliances, projecting American military strength yes. around the world. This is a Republican mm -hmm. ideological tenet, and, and Mr. Trump it was, goes against it was, all of those It was his ideas. own personal stamp, again, exactly. back to where we started. It was yeah. a personal stamp on foreign Absolutely. policy. And it this, wasn't a consensus it, view. No, not at all. No, he's been, he received pushback from kind of his own senior congressional leadership amongst many other parties. Um, and so this, I think, is the first time we've seen a real public divide. Now, I don't think that would immediately translate into kind of a, a change in opinion within the Senate, and they would still, because there are political ramifications from impeachment, Republicans would struggle to get re-elected if the president is tarnished by this scandal. Because until right now, they've allowed Trump to become the face and the body and the arm of the Republican Party. Absolutely. That's going to be a very difficult, painful yeah. divorce, and I think Republicans will wait until the last moment right. until they do it.
Excellent. So just for our clients, our you know, US clients or, or clients around the world who have business operations mm. uh, in the US, is there any impact from these developments on, on the economic forecast that we have for the US? So I would look, first of all, more to markets, because here we see financial markets with a much more sensitive response to the policy environment and to any potential uptick in political instability. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'd seen a few, kind of, we've actually over the course of 2019, just with regard to trade policy uncertainty and general concern over maybe the U.S. economy starting to slow, um, a little bit more volatility in financial markets. This will upset financial markets just because it's unclear what the next, obviously, kind of the line of succession is clear, but in terms of where U.S. policy is heading, what that means for the Republican Party, what that means for the 2020 election, all those big questions will justifiably kind of add an element of concern and and possibly hesitation uh, to investors. So we'd see a lot more volatility there, I would imagine. In terms of the real economic impact, though, in the near term, it'll be minimal because the U.S. is an enormous market economy. It is, in that way, preserved a little bit from political changes. Uh, And again, we see kind of modest variations in election year in terms of kind of public spending and how that fuels growth. But that really is how the political sphere impacts the real economy. So I wouldn't expect kind of a a dramatic shift if you were to be impeached. The one thing I would note, though, quickly, is that um, we've already seen the impending U.S. economic slowdown, not be driven by a bubble in the financial sector or any other kind of of these natural late cycle things we see that fragilities emerge in the banking sector. It's not driven by that. It's driven by policy uncertainty and the kind of question marks remaining over what the U.S.-China trade relationship will be like and all this is causing businesses to postpone investment. It hasn't yet hit employment, but that's a natural progression once investment has been postponed for two or three quarters. Um, And so we're already seeing that policy uncertainty generated under the Trump administration starting to result in slower investment and therefore slower growth. So another kind of jolt to the political sector could then just accelerate that process. So it's very possible then we'd head into the slowdown by the end of Q4 2019 or early 2020, um, a few months before we were already expecting that to happen. Absolutely. And just to sort of wrap this all up and finish where where we began, it's that impending slowdown and growing domestic pressure that also drives, I believe, Mr Trump's volatility in the foreign policy sector. So we've seen what's happened now with Syria and Turkey, but clients and and businesses should be, you know, partly expecting more volatility from Mr Trump Mm -hmm. as he sees more and more pressure both economically and uh, from from the political scene there in the US. Yeah, we've seen this a number of times. Whenever Trump feels under threat on the policy agenda, he tends to, we've seen this with North Korea, with the U.S.-China trade war, um, with threatening tariffs on Mexico, which were also very deeply unpopular amongst Republicans. Whenever he feels under threat for his policies, he tends to shun any support and go directly for the policy that he wants. Yeah. Um, and this is what tends to lead to the instability that we're seeing now. So we should all be on the lookout for further volatility in U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> Kaylin, Agat, thank you so much for a fantastic discussion. Both of these stories are fast moving and I'm sure we'll continue to cover them uh, very frequently here at the EIU. Just as always, do keep an eye on our Twitter feeds, both uh, of our individual staff members and our regional teams. And for our clients, uh, head to EIU.com. These stories and others we continue to cover on a very frequent basis, not just telling you what's happening, but also how we think it's going to unfold and also the key events and the key people that to keep an eye on as, as we keep an eye on these unfolding stories. But thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next month with another update of our Global Outlook.